Hi, and welcome to the Margaret E. Hagan Free Public Library. I'm Miss Jennifer, and today for another Book Buzz, we're going to do a wonderful pairing of Fallout and the Genius Underneath the Table. So, as conflict grows in Eastern Europe, what do you think life was like growing up during the Cold War on either side of the Iron Curtain? Today, we're doing a nonfiction and fiction pairing that gives you a good look at that. So let's start with our nonfiction book. It's our new book by Steve Shankin called Fallout, Spy, Super Bombs, and the Ultimate Cold War Showdown. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a mad chess game between two big powers, the United States and um, the USSR during the Cold War. Now, let's read the first part of it, a prologue, to get a look into life during the Cold War. Prologue, The Paperboy. The kid hiked up the dark stairwell to the sixth floor, hoping only for a decent tip, maybe 15 cents. Busting up a Russian spy ring was an unexpected bonus. It was Friday afternoon in June 1953, collection day for Jimmy Bozart, a 13-year-old paper boy for the Brooklyn Eagle. The newspaper cost 35 cents a week and most people threw in an extra nickel or dime. The two retired teachers at the top floor of this apartment building were a bit more generous. They usually gave him two quarters. Jimmy knocked on the teacher's door. One of the women greeted him and dropped coins into his hand. More coins than usual. To be polite, he waited until the door was closed to look down at his palm. It was good. One quarter and five nickels. But as Jimmy started down the stairwell, his heel caught in a step, and the money went flying. Coins bounced down the stairs, clanking and spinning. He scrambled after them. He found the quarter first, then four of the nickels. Where were the other one? The bulb in the ceiling fixture was out. Searching step by step and faint light angling in from a high window, Jimmy spotted the familiar sight of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello home, the back of a nickel. Only the back. Jimmy picked up the silver of the silvery metal. The coin had no front. He found the other side of coin on the landing. It had the usual front and smooth size as the Jefferson nickel, but it was hollow. Something was wedged in the space inside, something square and black. It looked like a tiny piece of film. Jimmy raced home wondering what he found. Everyone knew the Soviet spies had stolen American atomic bomb secrets during World War II. Now, with the United States and the Soviet Union locked in the Cold War, there must be new enemy spies out there. Could this coin be anything to do with that? At the Bozart family apartment, Jimmy's dad studied the tiny piece of film through a magnifying glass. He had no idea what it was or what the numbers meant. He told his son that he better show the strange find to the police. Jimmy thought of Carolyn Lewand, a girl in his 8th grade class whose dad was a detective. He ran to her apartment building and showed the coin and the film to Carolyn and her mother. But the detective was still at work. Jimmy dropped the coin into his pocket and left. When Carolyn's father came home, his wife told him that a redhead kid named Jimmy Bozart had come by with a hollow nickel and some kind of coded message he'd found inside. The second Lewin growled at her for letting the kid leave with potential explosive evidence of espionage. He hurried to the Bozart's apartment. Mr. Bozart didn't know where his son was. He mentioned that his wife was playing Big Noah in a nearby church. Maybe she'd seen the boy. Detective charged into the church and interrupted the game. No Jimmy. Lewin seized the bingo prize money just in case the nickel somehow wound up there. He stepped outside and saw a man pushing an ice cream cart down the sidewalk. He grabbed the ice cream man's change too, just in case. Then he turned and saw a bunch of boys playing stickball in the street. He looked the kids over one by one. His gaze froze on a kid with red hair with freckles. About his daughter's age. Barging into the game, he said, You Bozart! Jimmy nodded. What did you do with the nickel? Jimmy reached in his pocket and held it out. The man snatched the coin. He pulled the nickel from his own pocket and handed it over. So you're not on anything, the detective said. Jimmy took the new coin and went back to playing stickball. 
He would be a caution by the time he realized that he stumbled into a series of events that were moving the globe's two great powers to the brink of the third and final world war. Wow. And it goes from there where you find out about the spies and what they were doing and then how that was affected by all the different players in the game. The President of the United States, the um, President of the USSR, and how they worked it out or how they didn't work it out. And how tensions got so high that we had bomb threats and scary moments where we thought that the world would possibly end. That we can get there sometime soon. But now, what do you think of life was behind the Iron Curtain? That's a divide between um, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe was mostly controlled by Russia. Well, let's see from a guy who lives in the U.S. right now from his own experience. The Genius Under the Table, Growing Up Behind the Iron Curtain by Eugene Yelchin. This is a um, biography, basically, about his life when he lived in Russia, when he was USSR, as a Russian Jew, which was very, very hard. And it, very interesting, all the people he actually knew and what was going on and what it would look like to a boy his age. Chapter 1. The first time. I saw real American tourists. They hopped out of a tourist bus in Red Square in Moscow and cut in front of us in line. Nice manners, my mother shouted. We've been freezing our butts off for hours and they just breeze in like that. We were in line to a mausoleum where the founder of our country, Vladimir I. Lenin, was laid out embalmed like an Egyptian mummy. To see him, you had to wait your turn. Making noise near Lenin's mausoleum was forbidden. But the Americans laughed and spoke in loud voices. The Americans and my mother were breaking the rules. Everyone in line was staring at my mom for shouting. But I was staring at the Americans. The Americans' clothes were in vibrant colors I did not know existed. They did not fit in Red Square at all. The square may be called red, but it's black and white in the winter. Most citizens in line were also dressed in black and white. Other colors were brown, army green, navy blue, and the red of our country's banner flapping above the mausoleum. Those were the colors of the Soviet rainbow. My family had come to Moscow to watch my older brother Victor compete in figure skating competition, but Dad said it was our patriotic duty to see Lenin's mummy first. No one in the long line was allowed to complain, except for my mother, of course. What are you complaining about, citizen? The security guard whispered to mom. He looked nervous that she was making a scene in the most sacred place in our country. Complaining, my mother shouted. You didn't hear me complaining yet, young man. I demand to know your name and rank. Write it down, Victor. Who's in charge around here? At last, the line began to move, and mom, having let off a little steam, became perfectly calm. She took my hand, and we stepped into the mausoleum by the rules in silence. Wow. That is a difference between the way the American tourist came in and his life in Russia. So that is what it was like. You could read more with the genius under the table about life behind the Iron Curtain. Um, check out our other books about Eastern Europe and Russia and Cold War. Um, there's a lot of really good um, nonfiction by Stephen Schenken. And other fiction books and biography-like books by Eugene Yelkin. This is another book buzz. I'm Miss Jennifer, and I'll see you at the library.